We're live. Hey, it's Scott Lips, and welcome back to yet another episode of Spin Magazine's Lip Service. I'm joined with the members of Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum, Michael C. Hall and Peter. How are you guys? Really good. We're good. Thanks. Thanks for having awesome. Us. Peter, you're the drummer. Peter Yanowitz. Yep. Awesome. And Michael, we're going to get into your whole history, how you guys met, the tour coming up, the record. Obviously, there's so much to talk about, and obviously, your David Bowie stories are incredible, so I can't forget those, because I was telling you outside that I actually worked with uh, Amon for many years, so right. we probably share a few stories, but I think your stories are way better than mine. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of seeing you guys at Zebulon in LA. I think it was like a month ago with your manager, Michael, who's a great guy and a friend of mine for many years, with Matt Penfield. Great show. Love the show. Nice. Tell me how you met. I think it was on the set of, uh, or actually in the production of Hedwig and the Angry Inch. So how did that come about? Obviously, I want to get into your early days playing music, too. So, Yeah, I did uh, Hedwig on Broadway for a spell. and um, Whoops. That's all right. Uh, and Peter was the drummer in the Angry Inch, the band, and that's how we met. And, um, I mean, for me, that was actually my first, in any legitimate sense, uh, experience of fronting a band. And uh, I loved it. And... Um, and I got to know Peter, and we became friends, and we had the chance to play that music every night for a good amount of time. And then, um, yeah, Peter and Matt Katz Bowen, the uh, Phantom member. Matt, Matt will be calling in. We'll yeah, find yeah. Matt somewhere along oh, the yeah. way for sure. Okay, Matt. good. <laughs> uh, be, yeah. You guys knew each other from way back, but we're on the Hedwig tour, right? Yeah. After the Broadway show ended its run, we Matt and I went on the road for about eight months, and. Um, <clears throat> We'd stay in cities like L.A. for a month and San Francisco, and we just we were hanging out so much. Uh, we were like, let's hang out. When we get back to New York, we started, we, and we actually met up a bunch of times, started making music, and we had about five or six instrumentals. And I think Mike and I had dinner, and I dragged him back to the studio one night, just played him some stuff. And Mike was like, "Hey, I noticed you guys don't have any vocals on this, and uh, you want to come." I, let's let's do. Let's give it a go. Yeah, but yeah. it's true. But you've actually been singing your whole life. I mean, you've yeah, done a ton yeah. of Broadway since I was since I was a little kid. I mean, I was like a first soprano in the boys' choir, and uh, from there, yeah. I mean, I, it, things didn't really um, go in that direction as far as like being in bands, and and uh, I focused on the acting and kind of uh, went that route. But uh, yeah, I've always done a lot of singing and. Um, did I you mean, grow up around music? Was music what, a big part of your life? Not really. I mean, I mean, the, the, probably the most of the music I heard was probably like in church. You know, I went to church a lot when I was a kid, and um, but not you know enthusiastic celebratory church. More just kind of like turgid hymns. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so that was about it. I mean, I definitely you know I I I, I like music. I listened to the radio. I listened to. You know, I listened to the top forty. I listen. I, I would head home from church so I could listen to uh, Casey Kasem's top forty, and I wanted to get there at the beginning because all the good stuff was at the uh, like thirty five through forty. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I mean, when I when I uh, said suggested to Peter that I sing on stuff, I mean, it was just because I thought it would be fun. There was no like no aspiration for it to be anything other than like a something to do and peter you've uh, been playing with like the wallflowers and obviously your morning wood right and so yeah. and uh we'll talk about the fact that matt is on tour with blondie um so there's this incredible history there with you know being on the road and playing and and i guess given your broadway background it just made sense after a while for you to just maybe you didn't think about being in a band initially but it just seems like all the fe you know the pieces fell into place yeah it seems like you know the hedwig thing was 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 um a, a chance to sing uh, I think I think the 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 Broadway stuff I've done, I, you know, singing in that kind of more legit Broadway style, never felt like a totally natural fit. And in a way, doing the Hedwig stuff was more in sync with how you know whatever sounds I want to come out of my mouth. Yeah. And uh, and then the Lazarus thing happened, the Bowie musical, and that was kind of a step, uh, like a shot in the arm, like maybe I have some sort of business. Uh, doing something like this. Um, yeah, and I so want to take it back to the beginning, the, but yeah, yeah, I was going to say, because you brought it up, it's crazy. I mean, Michael, for you to sing David Bowie songs in front of David Bowie, yeah. that's got to be daunting. I mean, I can't imagine what yeah. that's like. I mean, when did you first meet him, and what was that like? Because, I mean, talk about being nervous. Like, yeah. I've had uh, Steven Tyler came to see me play drums once, and I almost couldn't play. Right. Singing in front of David Bowie his own songs, 
feels like it would be fairly daunting. It was insane. It was um, it was the first time I met him. I had the job technically, but I hadn't met him. He'd sort of um, allowed other members of the creative team to vouch for me, but I didn't feel like I officially had the job until that day. He came to the music director's apartment in the East Village. Um, I know he came through the door, but it seems like he just kind of <laughs> appeared in the room, right. you know, it's, uh, out of the mist. Um, he is but, uh, he is a bit mystical. Yeah, sure. totally. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, I've said it before, but I did have to, I think, turn off a part of my brain to to just. Uh, you know, just like, it's just a hologram. It's not really him, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, we, we exchanged pleasantries. He was incredibly like gracious and nice and like thanking me for doing the job, you know? And it was, it was all kind of crazy, but, uh, was there an audition process you had to go through to, to no, it was kind in? of, I mean, I, I, I knew, uh, about the project and I'd met with the director and I kind of put a word in for myself, even though it was a top secret project that I wasn't even supposed to know about. And, Luckily, I was doing Hedwig at the time, so I think my audition, in a way, was Hedwig. It was like a really, really well-produced, very glamorous audition, oh, uh, at least at least for Ivo Van Hove, the director. Yeah. And uh, and um, but you know, after we exchanged some pleasantries, it was time to sing through the songs, and there were like seven songs that I was going to sing in the show. And um, the music director suggested we do "Where Are We Now" first um, from. Uh, uh, the next day, and um, I up to that point had been keeping it together. But once once Henry Hay, the music director, started playing the opening bars of the song, I just I was like, oh God, what what is happening? <laughs> I, my stomach just like tied into a knot, and uh, yeah, I can't imagine and, and, singing and, in front of him. Yeah, though. and and he was sort of in my peripheral vision, sitting on the couch, smelling amazing, <laughs> um, and. Uh, he said, yes, now sing my songs for me, he said. You know, <laughs> and I think he, he, he could appreciate what an absurd situation it was, and yeah. it really put me at ease. I started the song, and by the time I got to the end, I heard him singing the ooze that he'd orchestrated for the version that we were going to do in the show, and I looked, and he had his eyes closed, and he was like singing the backing thing. That he, and, I was, and I thought, you know, I don't have to be nervous uh, from this point forward at any juncture in this production, no matter who we perform it for, where we perform it, this is, this this is, is it. The, this, this is, is the, the most nerve wracking <laughs> right. it's going to get. And uh, it's funny because I rewatched uh, some of the videos from Black Star, I think maybe this morning or yeah. last night. And it's almost a little uncomfortable to watch because you know that he knows he's like at the end of his yeah. career and dying. And, and, uh, and they kept it very quiet, obviously. But when you watch those, I mean, it's, it's almost just like prophecy where he know. I mean, the video to Lazarus even, right? Where he oh, has yeah. the tape on his eyes. And I mean, <laughs> he was always such a visionary. Yeah. Um, so to watch that is, is a bit difficult for me. And it always has been, but but such a great record. And, you know, yeah. I, some of my favorite records he did actually, I was thinking about the Trent Reznor collaboration he did some years back to, and, and so incredible. But taking it back to the beginning for all of you, I mean, when you think about New York and you think about rock bands, I mean, obviously Interpol, yeah, yeah, yeah's. The Strokes being one of the biggest. I mean, is it a little bit daunting when you think about coming from a huge TV career and then getting into kind of starting a new band? Even though these guys have incredible, you know, a history of, of playing in, in uh, amazing bands, mm-hmm. is that concept daunting to start a rock band out of New York? Because really, people move to LA. Like we were just sharing pictures of my uh, <laughs> my my hair metal days, yeah. right back in the day. But back back then, that's where you used to, you know, you'd move to LA and. Whenever it was, 87, a lot of bands now moved to Nashville. Mm. There's still not like a super vibrant, you know, rock scene in New York. So when you think about forming a band, even though it was sort of done on a whim and you already knew each other, it's a little bit daunting to be like, we're going to, you know, be in a rock band, not even a rock band. I guess it's sort of a, you have so many influences from Justice to Bach to, you know, Depeche Mode, right? There, there's a ton of uh, really unique uh, influences there. But the concept of playing music and starting a band in New York right now, was it sort of like, we're just going to do it and not think about it? Or did you just want to jump in and see where it went? Yeah. yeah. You, um, you, 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 you go. I think anytime you start a new band or a new creative project, and, you know, there's always that nervousness of, like, are people going to like it? You know, are, you know, you're sticking your neck out and, you know, you're just sort of asking for eyes and ears, you know. But I, I think the way, like, as Mike just said, like the organic way that the band started, we avoided some of that awkwardness just because the band sort of sprung out from under us. It, was, it wasn't like this real thought out, you know, 
thing that we had put all this, you know, like, hey, let's start a band and we'll be like this and this is the, what we'll wear and this is what we'll play. <laughs> it was just sort of like we had a whole record and we were like, I guess we're a band now. We should probably think of a name and maybe even do a show. Like it, it started to occur to us late. So we, we were able to avoid some of that just like those things that happen when you're starting a band, but also, you know, being at this particular juncture in our lives, I think at, at this age too, to start a band is extra kind of <laughs> right. weird. Yeah. Right. Like to be in a brand doing? new older <laughs> band, it's yeah. a weird, it's a weird thing. I think we try not to, to really think about it, but as far as New York goes, like, I don't know. I, I, I've lived here for almost 30 years and I feel like it's, a great place to start a band too. And I do feel like there's, you know, a great scene of, of cool young artists coming. I mean, maybe not like what it used to be and maybe LA is all, and Nashville are always gonna be like more music cities, I guess, but New York still has, there's still stuff going on here that I think is pretty cool. But the first few gigs you played, the, there was only what, like one or two songs that were actually out, right? And so what was the not audience? Even. Yeah, not even. I so. mean, yeah, our first couple or few gigs were maybe even more than a few that we hadn't released anything. So in a way, the fact that it was in New York and it was kind of like we were able to keep it um, underground without even trying just because, I mean, the gig was literally underground in a club <laughs> in Berlin. It was in a basement Berlin, somewhere. Yeah, it yeah. was in the basement in Berlin uh, um, on uh, 2nd Street and Avenue A in, in the East Village. And, you know, we didn't want to uh, put the cart ahead of the horse or whatever, whatever the expression um, Generally, we didn't want to do that. We also didn't want to do it because, you know, people know I'm an actor and it's it's sort of a, generally speaking, dicey or cheesy enough proposition to think, oh, it's an actor band. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we just wanted to, the, to keep following the music and let it lead. Definitely. And, and influence-wise, it's interesting, right, if you look at your bio, because everyone has these bios that are always very funny when I kind of repeat them back to them. It's like Black Sabbath, Georgia Moroto, and Bach, and Justice, right? And actually, ironically enough, there's almost no guitar, if any. I don't think there's any guitar on any of the music that's out, right? So Black Sabbath always seemed to, it's an interesting kind of influence. Were you all listening to the same kind of music, or did you all have, I mean, Radiohead seems to be a common thread. I, I would imagine when I listen to your music and <clears throat> seeing you live, I feel like you all are Fans of Radiohead, correct Absolutely. me if I'm wrong. Absolutely. Never heard of them. <laughs> but that feels like an <laughs> obvious one of a band that, you know, yeah. I, and, and I, you know, you can't deny the Bowie, you know, when, it, when yeah. you, your vocals are so powerful when you see live and, and you know, not a bad thing to have, you know, the Bowie influence run through the music. So. Right. I think, I mean, I think we have pretty disparate influences, but I do think we're all more or less children of the 80s. So I think there's, there's something about that era that, that infuses our collective sensibility without us really talking about it. I mean, we never talked about how <laughs> right. we want to sound, who right, we right. want to sound like or anything, but there is some sort of just, um, in terms of our ability to kind of work uh, collaboratively and in terms of our sensibility, there is some sort of pretty, pretty good sizable intersection mm. of sensibility. When you first get together as a band, obviously let's talk about the name, but as far as I know, you all had these nicknames, like Kaleidoscope, <laughs> Storm High. Have, have you ditched the names or the Dreamweaver or those names? Uh, and what was the concept no, behind that, really? I was that uh, like an internal thing, or was that something that was sort of uh, put out there to the public? Well, you know how Beyonce has Sasha Fierce? You know, it's her like alter ego. Actually, I didn't know until you, I mean, I remember it now, but yeah, I didn't remember like, it. Yeah, like, I'm a Virgo. I think that's a common Virgo thing where you, you know... <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's ridiculous. We gave each other nicknames. I think we each named, like, each other, and they. It was just like I don't know. When you're starting a band, you sort of feel like you're starting a gang. So it sort of went in there. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to talk about, but yeah, <laughs> I still call Mike Callie a lot and Matt Storm. You yeah, know, okay. just like. It's just in my phone, I was driving uh, in the car <laughs> with uh, my wife in the passenger seat, and that you know that Storm you know, Rider you know, comes up or something. Well, it's well, like, the the Google or the the Apple CarPlay thing says, message from Storm Eye and Dream Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> and Morgan looked yeah. at me like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's an internal thing, more or less, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, you know. And the name of the band is interesting, right? Because it, it actually came about from, I believe it was like Matt's, 
daughter or something, That's right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that come about? Because it's it's. It's an interesting concept, like having a. She said, it, "Like if I had a band, this yeah. would be the name of my band." I think. I think. Yeah, it was like it coincided with uh, the time where we were like, "Oh, are we a band? We should book a gig. We should. We should come up with a name." And we were trying to figure out what that might be. And yeah, she said one day, "I think uh, I'm going to start a band one day." And Matt asked her what the name would be, and she said, "Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum." <laughs> and he said, "Can I steal that?" And By the way, you're eight. You shouldn't be starting a band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think she was like. What five? Six? Yeah, she was five. Uh, okay. she, or yeah. five. Yeah, yeah. E- even better. But, yeah, she graciously just gave the name to us. She's like, "You can use it," and uh, <laughs> and then several people tried to talk us out of using yeah. that yeah. as a name. Uh, and you know, I think the exact quotes were like, "Hey, yeah, if you if you choose that name, a lot of people aren't going to check you out. They're just yeah. not going to like." In, you know, investigate your music. So we were like, ah, yeah. We did try to change it, and it just That's never, nothing ever stuck. You know, better than Princess. It, it seemed to fit the music that we were making. Having seen you live, I, it definitely fits for sure. But initially, I, I, yeah, it took some, a minute to sort of understand. It almost sounds like an album title. Um, it definitely could be an album title, which you know. But but talk about it, you know, Michael. You have so much on your plate. Obviously, Dexter just finished. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a spinoff because. You know, there could be, you never know. I mean, I'm not sure, but the way that it ended, I guess right. there's so many possibilities and ways and directions it could go. Six Feet Under, Dexter, a lot on your plate. So when you're starting a band like this, obviously, are you thinking, like, I have to squeeze into touring with my shooting schedule? Or again, does it feel like everything's just organic the way you yeah, wing everything? Yeah, just taking it as it comes. You yeah. know, I, 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 it's, I mean, now we're at a point where we are kind of thinking in the future to to some degree and making touring plans and I certainly but I don't know I mean there's a lot a lot has been on my plate yeah. but uh but at the moment um you have time to do this I have I, yeah I, I have time to do this and um and I love it it's 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 um like one of the most um surprising developments in my life yeah you know it's something that I it, it's true for I think all three of us. Not as we've said, not, none of us really planned on, and uh, we're just kind of trying to catch up to it. Sometimes those happy accents are the best kind, right? Yeah. So take me back to like 2020. You play this gig. The pandemic is. It's like the day before, the day after the this announcement's made, and it's billed as the last show ever. <laughs> which um, obviously it wasn't, but uh, at the time, what was going through your head, and when you were thinking like we're going to use this downtime to write a record, and you know everyone's going to be locked at home anyway, we didn't really know back then. I always make these jokes, and I was talking about it the other day. You remember when we were like wiping down the groceries and like the bananas or the apples? I mean, I'm not sure if anyone got you know COVID from a banana or a cereal box, but at the time, I was like diligently wiping down my groceries. So that time in particular, no one knew what was going on. So to build this as like you know the last show ever, right? It could have been, but uh, what was going through your minds when you sort of started to play out in New York and and that happened? And we were all literally locked down for a couple of years. I think it was billed as the last show a little bit after the fact. I mean, w- we did become aware, I guess, that night that everything was shutting down, and um, you know, it was a uh, nobody knew. Not that anybody knows what the hell's going on now, but nobody right. knew what was happening in a different way then. Um, and, yeah, we were just um, hoping people would show up as much as anything because because people were, um, you know, we'd done a gig there that was completely packed probably uh, a couple months before that or a month and a half, and, and we're wondering if uh, we would have a crowd. We did. I think there were some people who probably were scared off, and in hindsight, maybe that was... Uh, wise of them but uh i remember literally when that announcement was made it was whatever day it was in march like i had a guy that was working me literally like ran home like i never saw him again ever i've since <laughs> oh, man. i've never seen this guy casualty um, yeah i mean people just started you know as we all did for a moment they're panicking but also you had this great opportunity to write music and <coughs> and obviously you know the ep the record so during this downtime were you getting together were you sharing files i mean there was that period like we spoke about where no one was seeing each other so were you all getting together like safely or whatever it may be at the time yeah we luckily had the project was you know we had had an, a previous year or two of just working and writing in the studio we have a little studio near union square and so we'd already been involved in just promote you know getting as much music going as we could and following every lead on every idea that we had so when that when the when the pandemic hit full force, we just 
we were supposed to actually go out to LA and work with Dave Catching at Rancho de la Luna. And, All do right. it. and we were maybe going to make a completely different desert rock electronic princess EP, you know, with Dave. <laughs> and we were really excited about that, but then that got blown out and we, we were like, well, let's just keep going with what we're doing. And, you know, we, we produced, self-produced our own EP. So like, let's, let's pull together these songs and make some new ones this year. And it, it became this just incredible opportunity to keep each other focused, stay creative during a really weird, scary time in New York. And also just all of a sudden this, you know, you start building a record like one song at a time. And all of a sudden this beautiful like record came together that only could have happened during that year and, and a lot of songs came out that year and summer that we'd had you know been working on before the pandemic so it was just l lucky for us that we yeah we would send each other files we would get together sometimes Michael would send a vocal on a cell phone that he would just sing into it and we'd just put that straight into Pro Tools and those cell phone vocals ended up on the record it was just one of these things where we felt like everything we were touching was like sort of working so it was like, it's weird. amazing how good you can get vocals to sound on an iPhone in a woodshed <laughs> yeah it's true do you ever go in a room and just rehearse I mean I, because obviously these records are made I think at your studio with your headphones and um, your neighbors must love you I guess I, I'm not sure <laughs> but uh, I heard you have one neighbor that's like a poet that is like reciting lyrics or something so yeah I think she right? might be uh, actually be on the next uh, record really she, she yeah came in and, she's and, from Columbia yeah, yeah she's she's our biggest fan she'll like <laughs> if other neighbors complain she'll go and like knock on their door and be like it's Peter. You got you know, like we got. Like, she doesn't need to go to the shows because she can hear it between the walls. Yeah, right? she's a little agoraphobic, <laughs> but she she's she comes over and she loves Prince. But yeah, we'd yeah. get together periodically, and some th songs emerged in the studio. Some songs we maybe put together based on component parts that we'd shared. Um, it, it, that happened all kinds of ways. But yeah, we would periodically, and more and more as the pandemic went on, get together and try to realize things in the room that were maybe some sort of Frankenstein thing up yeah, to that point. Definitely. And is there new music that you're working on now? Because obviously there's a tour coming up in July that we'll get into. It's exciting. It's like, I don't know if it's eight or nine cities. Then you end in your hometown, I believe. In Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh, North Carolina, right. which is really exciting for you guys. Um, but yeah, let's talk about it. There's new Because you're constantly creating music, right? So is there a new record that you're actually working on now to come out sometime this year or next year? Yeah, we have a full record mixed and mastered that's ready to go, and then now we just started mixing a follow up to that. So we we're we're gonna have like nine records. <laughs> I mean, you soon. know, <laughs> we are we love we love making stuff, and the studio has been a great just play, playground for us. But I think uh, being in bands, I don't know. You probably know from your past and being in bands, like you write a record, and then it's like, oh shit, we got to write the second record, and it can be pretty daunting to to just be like, okay, we're writing the second record now. It, it really just even saying that it's there's this thing that gets put on stuff but if you I think our thing is let's stay ahead let's stay a couple records ahead so we never have this like sophomore slump or yeah you know and and you know how it is being creative it's you just want to keep the energy going because if you drop it it can you can actually forget how to write a song you'd no be like question. what the fuck like yeah, well, I think it's great. I mean, now that things are opening back up, there are so many shows happening, and I think the tour will be great for you guys. I mean, Michael, do you ever go into this, like, dark place lyrically? Obviously, the TV show, you've always been on these shows that are, like, associated with, like, death and, you know, yeah. murder. And, I mean, I, I can't imagine that lyrically it doesn't seep into your brain a little bit. Because at some point, you probably, there's, like, art imitates life. And I, I feel like I listened to interviews with you where you were like, I went home that day, and I sort of thought what I was doing was okay because I did it on TV, whatever it may be. Uh -huh. And so... Do you draw from that lyrically? I mean, is it? I mean, it's got to be a weird headspace to be in when you're playing like a serial killer. I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't have that explicitly uh, in mind. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think you know whatever is happening lyrically is more, at least as I conceive of it, about what what I'm thinking, not um, any sort of character I've played. But you know. I, it, it all goes into the mix, yeah, you know, yeah. and and um, I can't um, I can't deny that that um, death in one form or another has been a component of uh, a lot of what I've done. Actually, the first day I met uh, Bowie, he asked me. I, I I mentioned someone I knew in common. I was working on a movie. He said, "What's the movie about?" It's like it was about a woman who shoots herself on television. And he said, <laughs> "What's it with you and death?" <laughs> And I said, I don't know, man. 
Well, it is. Uh, I mean, is, is it hard to put that away when you when you are filming a show like Dexter? When you get home at night, can I you mean, compartmentalize that and be like, "That's just my job," you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't. I'm not like, "Oh man, I killed all those people." <laughs> oh no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, no, no but there was I, like a vigilante aspect to the show, yeah, right? Where it's sort of like I don't know. I mean, it's cathartic. I'm yeah. glad that I've found outlets to simulate that kind of crazy behavior. It's probably tempered. Uh, tempered my my real life exploits and uh i don't know it's nice to be able to ritually sort of exercise your demons or um or um do away with uh, <laughs> yeah. uh whatever you might in a less healthy way try to do away with um i don't know <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, though. I mean, I, I would have a hard time putting that away at night for sure. Right. Um, that was my Halloween costume, by the way, this year. So I, oh, I'll, cool. I'll show you the picture. Well, yeah, what did, you, what did you? I was I wore the, you know, the apron with the knife. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was, okay. I'll the show kill you. suit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I had no idea I'd be meeting you. It's a kind of a weird, right. ironic twist to everything. <laughs> but um, are you sad that the show's ended? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you'll have a lot of other projects coming up. How do you feel about the show? And, no. Yeah, sure. I'd, All right, so we're um, back. I was going to say, I was saying to you, um, God, I lost my train of thought there. Do you ever feel like uh, we were we were just chatting about you know the show being end the show ending and, and right. how you felt about the show ending and yeah. do you feel like you know it, it could possibly come back or you know how do you feel about it? I mean, you know, I've learned to say never say never um, about anything, but um, you know, I think the show ended in a pretty definitive way in that final reboot season. So I, I you know, I'm not. I don't have any uh, calendar dates marked where I'm going <laughs> right. to pretend to be that guy anymore. There's not um, a six feet under reboot to number no, two. No, <laughs> no. Three um, feet under. I don't know. There could be. A the, I, I, uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't feel. Uh, I feel proud of the 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 whole of it, and I'm glad that we went back and 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 revisited the character and gave the show a sort of ending that it that it needed. I think, um, but. I don't know. It's kind of nice to be uh, released. Yeah, because that's a grueling schedule. We were talking about the fact that you you were filming around Sunset and Gower Studios, which yeah. is where I literally live. Uh, not to give away my address on the show, but <laughs> I do live quite close to there. And so it's a different kind of thing. Now you're going on the road. You're in a van, possibly, or a tour bus. <laughs> I'm not sure which one you're in. Which Would it be a van or a combination Sprint of? Van so a Sprinter van. Okay. Yeah. And we've all done that. We've done like yeah. the Sprinter van. We've had the tour bus. We've done. I've done like the cheap flights. I, my van used to get mad at me because I would just like pay the $100 to take like an easy jet fly. And they're like, why don't you, you know, come on the bus with us? I'm like, I can't sleep. My head's hitting against the thing. Um, but it, but it's, it's a strange life, right? So you've, you've yeah. led all these different lives. At this point, you have literally nine lives, right? So right. when you're out there on the road, and you're and you're really grinding and you're playing the crowds that love you and obviously a lot of momentum we're on the spin magazine you know lip service podcast tons of momentum <laughs> um no um but i mean is it a different life you when you've you've led all these lives in the sense of been on a very successful tv show a few um and yeah now it's, you're it's, doing this uh it's yeah it's totally different i mean yeah when i go when we've gone on tour i'm like i'm living the dream it's yeah. the dream of a 21 year old but yeah. uh, it's a dream <laughs> yeah. uh it's it's um it's fun i mean it, just just um I mean, i've done long runs of shows like i did with peter you know doing the same show every night eight times a week even. headwake yeah uh yeah and um and other th theatrical productions and the grind of a tv schedule but yeah there's something definitely unique about touring and and um but it's um i don't know i mean i, I kind of you know you have a love relate love hate relationship with the logistical realities of it you know it's like every morning you wake up and you're tied to the train tracks again waiting <laughs> to get run over and the only time you get relief is when the train is running you yeah. over you know i always say it's like it's what do you do the other 23 hours of the day the hour on stage yeah. is great yeah but it's like how do you kill my band members used to sleep to like four in the afternoon and i take one of those tour buses through every city because I like history, and I like going to wherever. I'm in Austin, and I take the double-decker tour bus, but it's interesting just taking those tourist buses and learning about the history of cities. But those other guys would sleep till 4. I'm like, I've never slept till 4 p.m. my entire life. I, I don't even know how you do that. Um, but do you go out and explore the cities? Because you're hitting, like, I think in July, we're ta we'll talk about it, but Chicago, Nashville, Detroit, Atlanta, Baltimore, like... What are you doing to occupy the days? Are you out there doing stuff during the days? You're not sleeping in the Sprinter van, obviously. So Not really. 
Yeah, we're either flying. I mean, we do a little bit of flying too, just yeah. if it's a longer drive on a day of a show. But a lot of times we're driving to the next show. And But yeah, when you're in a city like Austin or you know, Nashville, you want to go out and we usually try to find a good restaurant. We, we like hanging out together. You, you actually like each other, which is we great. We actually like yeah, each other. So far. Um, so far. Yeah, so yeah, far, so good, right? Not a lot of drama in yeah. this band. But, and there's I also three of us, so it's yeah. it's pretty pretty cool. We got a, a good crew and, um, you know, I think – but you're right. It is about that one hour, and, and I feel like we're – this year we've been able to tour and to find out who our audience actually is. Yeah. And that, that's been kind of mind-blowing to us just to show up to these cities – we're still relatively under the radar as a band, but then we show up and our shows are selling out and there's these fans that are sometimes screaming louder than the music that we're playing on stage. So it's kind of like something weird is happening that's, again, out of it's out of our hands a yeah. little bit. So so that one hour a day kind of sets you up for the other 23. Like it almost is enough of a love fest that you can, you, you just trudge through the rest of it, you know? No, the shows are selling out everywhere, and that's what Michael and I were talking about. I mean, there's not a show that hasn't sold out yet at Sony, but I was watching you in this, on your Instagram, this, uh, like in the van, like eating chips at a you know, <laughs> truck stop, and I was thinking, I've done that before. Right. I know what that's like. So, it's, But, it, you know, I also wasn't on uh, two hit TV shows. So, I, you know, it's, uh, right. it's got to be strange, but, uh, but, you know, we've all had different past in life, so it's interesting that you're doing this now, and, and obviously it's such a great band. Ketamine, the remix EP, uh, just came out. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. And the song, you know, the meaning behind ketamine. I'm imagining that you didn't do a lot of ketamine growing up, but uh, you never know. I mean, maybe maybe no, you did, Peter. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's, it's, done it. um, <laughs> I've never done it. It's it's a song that lyrically was at least inspired by an experience I have doing uh, had doing ketamine th therapeutically in a in a doctor's office uh, with my then girlfriend now now wife, um, and. Um, it's about having um, had a, a, a trip um, alongside someone um, who I was at least aware enough was having a very different trip. Mm. What's and that like, by the way? It's got to be. It's like, it's like ketamine, the yeah. song. It's like those <laughs> lyrics. I mean, it's like, it's like a, a sense of, you know, wanting to go on your own ride, but, but aware that this person you're connecting to is on a very different one. And... Uh, I guess I guess maybe it is a sort of distillation of a part of what it's like to be in a relationship. You know, are you having? Could you not have a bad trip if you're sitting in a very controlled environment? No, you can still you go can have, to yeah, a, a dark you know, place. A dark yeah. place. Um, I imagine your brain goes to very dark. Given what you, no, mine <laughs> was mine was <laughs> actually really really uh, pretty surprisingly shiny and uh, shimmering. <laughs> um, but uh, but hers was a little darker, and so that was the inspiration. Now the song is remixed. Yeah. You had like four artists actually yeah. remix the song. That was, um, I think that was your idea to. Yeah, we I were mean, in Europe, and I was just I think actually somebody mentioned like, hey, you guys should do a remix, and 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 I was thinking about our songs. Ketamine seemed like a real open ended song where there's not a lot going on, so it felt like a good one. And then you know you turned me on to the armed. Uh, ultra pop and we just reached out to them on Instagram and they wrote right back saying like yeah we don't really like doing remixes but we love this song we'll give it a go and it just like sort of happened like that but yeah we got four four really different versions and um yeah and yeah I've done ketamine a couple times just recre recreationally yeah <laughs> snorted it and wow. it's really intense really. it's like horse tranquilizer right yeah like it's I mean I've done acid and mushrooms but ketamine like to me it did something that none of those other psychedelic crazy drugs do. It it really. I've done some recording on it too. I wouldn't recommend it. It's <laughs> yeah. but it's you wouldn't play live on it. It could oh, be a God, really no, bad. No. No, it could be a bad. But experience. I have recorded on it and it's <laughs> yeah. done some interesting uh, some interesting things. I'm too much of a control freak, so I feel like that's something I would have no. I mean, mushrooms are like it's, it feels like nothing when I've done them. But I don't. I never really do. Other well, you're drugs a drummer, now. right? You can't, can't really do much yeah, when you you're drumming. Yeah. Otherwise, nothing. It's Caffeine. hard to keep time when you're taking something that it kind is. of takes you out of time. Yeah. It is. It is. We were talking about electric drums before, and just the approach of like living in an apartment and playing drums, and the fact that being in New York, it's so hard to really, you know, work on your craft unless you go to studios. So, do you ever feel like uh, being in New York, it's like different than if you lived somewhere else and were making records? Because obviously, you're in this controlled environment here. Yeah, I still love it making music here. Um, it's to me, uh, you know, everybody talks about on oh, New York, it used to be cool, or it's New York sucks. That's ah, still mean, the coolest place. To me, in the world. this there's still like 
this idea that your life can literally change around the next corner just because you might run into someone or you might have one of those weird nights where you go out and like literally your life changes because of the people you met. Yeah. It's still one of those places, but, and and I was walking around the other day and it's just like thriving right now. There's so many people out and like young people and it feels like kind of like it hasn't really changed that much, even though, yeah, it has changed a lot. I agree. And I was going to talk to Matt too about his experience in Blondie and Cindy Lauper and your experiences in the Wallflowers, which I didn't know that you played with in Morningwood. How's it different than being in this band? And obviously, Michael, this is your first band, but we talked about your past and such a, an amazing history there too. It's yeah, I've been a I've been a band guy pretty much my whole you know musical life, starting in the Wallflowers um, back in the early '90s, and. Uh, and I just was attracted to that like idea that oh, if I'm in a band, that means I'll automatically have friends because you know, being growing up in Utah, I was Jewish. I, I didn't didn't have a lot of friends. You know, I was sort of on the outside of most things there. So getting in a band in Utah was like for the first time I felt like this brotherhood. And um, and then you know I've been in a lot of bands like the Wallflowers and Morningwood, but it's weird like. I felt like I was done with being in bands. I just felt like I'd, I'm kind of old now. And like right. I did Hedwig with Mike and that immediately woke me up. I was like, oh shit, like I've really been missing this, like playing in a band every night or, and being with, being with friends. And then this band kind of just sprung out. And so I think it's weird. I don't know, they, you know, the universe like saved the best for last, you know. This Definitely. band has like been, as long as it goes, as much music as we make, it, every second of it has been like really, really rewarding and fun. Yeah, amazing. And Michael, there are other film projects coming up and TV projects that you have nah. slated. Now this is it. This is uh, yeah. I mean, ready, you set, know, go. something will something will happen. I haven't yeah. completely forsaken my uh, day job, but uh, would you do Broadway again if it came up? Is it something that you love doing? Sure, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I I I don't know. I don't. I, I've never. I've never known what was ha- going to happen next. That's a part of what's great and s- slash maddening about you know being an actor or being in show business more broadly. Um, but uh, I wouldn't change it, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm sure there are some really cool things that I can't tell you about because I don't know about them yet, and probably some not so cool things <laughs> right. that I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you about so that I wouldn't do. But you know, <laughs> we'll see. Definitely. Well, the tour kicks off July. I'm excited. Love to see you guys again. Zebulon, the show is amazing. Princess goes to the Butterfly Museum. I love you guys. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for being here. And uh, follow everyone Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The EP Ketamine remix just came out. What else do we need to plug? There's so much to plug, right? It's like, well, the tour really being the most. Yeah, you know, thing shows uh, just shows the next six months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got a bunch of videos up on the YouTube channel. Yeah, sure. yeah. and the new record, Fun. which will, you know, the the five new records, like apparently <laughs> yeah. they have that are yeah, coming the out. I guess, album. right? Definitely. And Michael, like, it, hopefully they'll be. You never know. Again, like I said, it could be a season nine that we don't know about. You could come back <laughs> from the dead. Who knows? You know. Um, but uh, looking forward to seeing you on the screen and definitely seeing the band again and I'll come with Michael I, I love your manager a great guy and thanks for being here I really appreciate yeah, it thanks thank for you. having thanks us thanks for Scott. taking the awesome. time thank you appreciate Cheers. it